Um, welcome everyone to our Wednesday edition of Invasive Lunch um, for a California Invasive Species Action Week, hosted by University of California Agriculture and Natural Resources, which I represent, um, and the California Invasive Plant Council. Doug, would you like to welcome folks? Yes, thanks, Sabrina. Um, thanks for joining our uh, third webinar of the week. Um, they've been going great so far, and we have record attendance. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, and here, here are your hosts. Um, Doug, did you want to say a few words about Calypsy? Sure. Calypsy, the California Invasive Plant Council, is a nonprofit organization um, started in the 1990s. Um, we are statewide, and we work to promote um, sound restoration techniques of the state's natural areas. And I'm with University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. We run the, the Cooperative Extension Program is the largest piece of at the um, ANR part of University of California. Um, and as part of that, we run programs you might be familiar with. We have extension advisors in offices in every county in California. We run the 4-H program, the Master Gardeners, and the California Naturalist programs as well. And I'm the natural resources advisor for Los Angeles and Ventura counties. And uh, um, just oh, one more thing. This is Yuta yes. Berger. I'm also with the California Invasive Plant Council. And I will be uh, I will be transmitting your questions from the Q&A session. And I did want to mention, and Sabrina, I think you could also weigh in there. Um, we did have one question about uh, citizen science um, uh, opportunities for reporting invasive plants, um, such as wild spotter. Um, I can mention one locally here, which is um, calflora.org, Observer Pro is for um, recording any, it's a great citizen science tool for reporting any plants, including invasive plants, but the information goes directly to land managers. Sabrina, do you have a couple of others? Um, sure, well, you can use things like iNaturalist okay, to so. um, mm -hmm. note invasive species, and there are some iNaturalist projects that focus on specific invasive species. Um, and then there are additional programs. We're actually gonna be working with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife um, a little bit later this year to help with a, a larger launch of their program to report aquatic invasive species. Okay, and uh, Yuta, I believe I was monitoring the Q&A and you were doing the chat today, is that correct? Ah. We can do that. Um, sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm monitoring the chat as well, Sabrina. Just oh, FYI. okay. <laughs> Sorry, got a little confused there. All right. Um, okay. Move on. Nope. I keep having to switch back to the right controls. Um, just a few notes. Um, if you are in full screen mode and you don't want to be in full screen mode, um, you can press escape and get out of that to get access to other things on your computer. Um, if I could ask Doug to go ahead and type the um, call-in information into the chat in case people are having difficulty um, hearing the audio. Um, there's always the option of calling in and still watching the audio feed. You can move the speaker boxes around if you grab them. And again, I'll mention that we're going to use the chat for um, tech help and for sharing things like links. So please use the Q&A function for um, asking sort of substantive questions for our presenter today. Um, we are on Wednesday, so we're gonna be focused on using environmental DNA to find invasive species. And our speaker will be telling us more about what environmental DNA is. And before we get started, we wanted to acknowledge that um, Today, there is a call for, um, for an action in support of um, Black Lives called Shutdown STEM. And um, we wanted to share some of that information um, 
we actually posted it on the Invasive Lunch 2020 website, so you can follow any of these links here, but we hope that in addition to spending time with us today learning about invasive species and environmental DNA, you'll also take some time today to learn about systemic racism and how that affects our capacity to support our communities and to do um, the best science that we can be doing. So we have a few polls that we wanted to share today. Whoops, sorry. Um, we wanted to find out where you live and how familiar you are with invasive species. Oh. Okay. Um, And it looks like I, Craig, uh, uh, Doug, sorry, I'm launching the poll that we might have start, started filling in yesterday. Um, no, this is a, excuse me, a, a new poll. Oh, was it open previously to this? Were people seeing this? Good question. Let us know in the chat. <laughs> hey, <laughs> sorry about this. We've, we've decided to switch things up and we're having a little technical difficulties. Okay, everybody did the poll already. Great. Um, yeah, I'm going like to go ahead. A little, cl little clock on it, it said it was open for 16 minutes. So. Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I must have forgotten to close it when we were getting ready. I apologize if you didn't have a, a chance to fill it out now that I've ended the polling. And we'll just do a quick look at results. So most of you are joining us from California, but we do have um, um, a few folks joining us internationally and from other parts of the United States. And it looks like many of you have some familiarity with invasive species, which is great to know. Um, but we look forward to sharing with you today another aspect of how we study invasive species. Okay out of my way here. And um, joining us today is Rachel Meyer. She's a professor at uh, UC Santa Cruz, and she's also the director of the California eDNA program, which involves um, faculty from several different campuses who are coming together to use this really neat tool to study um, many things about ecosystems of California, but she's going to focus for us today on invasive species and how, it, how eDNA can be applied to those questions. So I'm going to stop my share, Rachel, to give you a chance to start yours. Thanks, Sabrina, and thanks, Doug and Yuta. I really appreciate being able to be here today. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yes, coming through loud and clear. Cool, let's get going. All right, so I'm gonna to talk today about invasive plant networks and Cali DNA. And I appreciate the introduction about the program. We're um, pretty new, let's see. We started um, sort of as a stem from the UC Conservation Genomics Consortium that started in 2016 and had a lot of different campuses involved in developing new ways of doing conservation genomics and genetics that would be more translatable. And everyone was very excited about environmental DNA. And so we created this environmental DNA citizen science community science program. Um, called Cali DNA. Uh, it started in 2017, so we're going on our third year, and um, and it took us a while to really get going with our methods. And so right now we have a lot of new research coming out um, in press. So it's a really exciting time where I can actually like report instead of like we think we can do this, um, some really cool results to you today. Um, so our program, Cali DNA, works by having people um, connect with us usually um, in classes or online just by going to the website and saying, hey, I want to I collect some samples. 
we work with them to figure out where they can go, where we have permits, whether that's a UC reserve or um, some place where we are able to, to get permission and um, people go collect samples either on their own or with us in coordinated bio blitzes that all they have to do is put on gloves and bring some tubes that we send them and fill that with surface soil or sediment and then send that back to the lab. We pay for the shipping, we analyze the data, um, and then put the results online for people to explore. And what we are really trying to build, and um, I'd love to be able to connect more with all of you on this, is a feedback loop where if you see results that you think are interesting, you have hypotheses that you can help inform the, the research teams that are um, at the different UC campuses in what to do next. And we can help do analyses. We can also help create tools to be able to have you do analyses on your own much more easily um, or use these um, DNA data as teaching tools in your classroom so, uh, or, or for land management. So I'm going to talk about some of those examples today. So this is just a little cartoon overview of what the experience is like. We send you a kit. Um, there's an app that geotags the samples that you're collecting and where you can also take other metadata. Um, we used to use Slurpee straws. Uh, now we are moving into non-plastic collection <laughs> tools. <laughs> and, um, and we're also, we used to use more of these uh, little meters for collecting pH and um, salinity and temperature and light data. Those little local um, environmental data are really important for understanding how biodiversity is shaped, but we've been actually collaborating much more recently with NASA to, um, to be able to use uh, remote sensing data for this. So there's no pressure to have to use all these meters. You can collect the samples in very little time now. Um, and we often encourage people after they collect the sample to go collect um, iNaturalist observations and that we can use to sort of ground truth our results. So I'm going to just give you a little background on DNA metabarcoding, which is the technique that we use in case you're not familiar with it. So a DNA barcode is a region of DNA that is very variable from species to species. And it's flanked by hyper-conserved regions of DNA. So where you can put primers, and if you have a forward and reverse primer and a bunch of enzymes and um, nucleotides and template DNA, say from the soil that you extracted, you can make copies of anything that those primers can bind to and any of the variable region in between. So here's our hyper variable region, or, or sorry, hyper conserved regions, our primers, and this would be the barcoding target region in between where you see that you have a lot of variability in this B3 and B4 region, for example, from 16S, um, which is a typical barcode that people use um, for a lot of different species. So here, this is just a screenshot from Wikipedia are some very common barcoding loci, just regions where people have sequenced museum specimens, um, other types of herbarium collections and voucher material, so that online you can find a species and its barcode DNA read from, from CO1 or site B or 12S. And so if I detect that in my sample, I can match it to what people have put online. So metabarcoding exploits the DNA barcoding that people have basically been doing since 1982. It's kind of shocking how long we've been generating these little DNA snippets and putting them in public databases for common use. Um, we can exploit that and say, okay, I'm gonna extract DNA from a sample. I'm going to amplify every piece of DNA that my primers will stick to. I'll make lots of copies of that and I will sequence all of them using next generation sequencing. We use an Illumina MySeq or an Illumina NextSeq machine. And then I'm going to be able to match these DNA sequences to all of the public databases of DNA barcodes um, and also now whole genomes, which is really exciting because we can broaden out from these. 
and I'm going to identify lots of different species. And so this is what a metabarcode result looks like. This is one that I generated just yesterday. We have 172 sites where we have DNA collections on the x-axis here, and on the y-axis are taxa, and you can't read all those taxon names because there are so many of them. So each little blip is a detection of a taxon across all of these different sites. And so you can actually kind of think of this as a way of making a quantitative fingerprint of what a habitat looks like. So this, you know, presence absence pattern of dots might look similar for all chaparral and very different from a high elevation area. And so um, we're kind of exploring what these presence absence patterns might um, help us do for conservation and land management. So this was the bioblitz from yesterday, or sorry, sorry, the bioblitz from um, the Russian River that we did the day before quarantine, and I just showed you some of those results from that 18S data. And I'm just going to give you a little bit more detail about this, about the biodiversity that we track. So this is a synthetic tree of life that was made with the Open Tree of Life software um, that uh, you can see has thousands of taxa in it. So from just two days of field work where a lot of people went out to all these different parts of the Russian River, we were able to track about 5,000 eukaryotic species. I'm just getting the data back from the prokaryotic species, the bacteria and archaea. Um, but here's, um, here's vascular plants, here's vertebrates, here's invertebrates, here's fungi. And so we have an incredible amount of diversity. And the yellow on the outside of this circle is um, where you have that taxon only observed a single time. And the green is where we've seen them many times. And we're very sensitive to the biodiversity, even if you have a little piece of, a, one piece of DNA and lots and lots of other DNA from say like the, the algae in the local area, we have a high likelihood of still detecting that rare piece of DNA. We're really trying to optimize our strategies and sequence more deeply. I'm gonna give a little vignette of why this giraffe is on the screen right now. It's because we detected its DNA in one of the samples. We got 2,600 giraffe DNA reads in one of the samples from the Russian River, and that's how I figured out where the safari was in Sonoma County. <laughs> So um, Mark West Creek actually had uh, detectable amounts of giraffe DNA three kilometers downstream from the safari, from this safari park. So move over Carol Baskin. We've got it here and we can detect everything that everyone has in their wildlife parks um, using this technique. So here's, we're here to talk about plants. So I'm gonna not talk about giraffes anymore. But um, here's an example of a whole bunch of common taxa. There are different colors in these 172 sites from the Russian River. And this dark purple, these dark purple bars, that's eucalyptus. And it has swamped some of the signals in a lot of these samples. So it's common in a lot of samples, but not in all the samples. And what we can actually do is we can exploit this and say, okay, well, let's see what bacteria and fungi and algae and other plant materials um, the, the, the eucalyptus is associated with when we find its DNA in the sample. And so this is an example of bacteria that live on a leaf. If you take a leaf and you squash it onto some growth medium, bacteria you can culture from that leaf and you'll get a nice imprint like this. I believe this is an example I stole from the internet on soybean. Um, so what we can actually do is make co-occurrence networks where we're not culturing anything. We're just looking at every time I see eucalyptus, what else do I find um, when we have all of these different sites and all of these different taxa. Um, we end up getting these robust co-occurrences and we build co-occurrence networks. Here's an example from the Klamath Mountains where we've built a network between Ceanothus or, and detected a, a relationship between Ceanothus and um, an endophytic uh, fung fungus. So um, 
I, yeah, okay. So um, we require having multiple observations of a species in order to be able to make a network. So um, here's eucalyptus on the left. Here's our sites again, our 172 sites on the x-axis. Um, the eucalyptus on the left part of this screen, you see that we can, we observe it in many different sites. And that's good. That means we can actually use this for network analysis and figure out what are the partners with eucalyptus. Here's another example that I'm really excited about, Ludwigia um, or the water primrose. That's a terrible invasive in California and elsewhere, um, I think around the country. I, and and um, my background is in more crop plants for plant biology. So I really rely on you all to tell me what are the really important plants to be studying here. But we can actually can do network analysis for Ludwigia. Other things like um, nasturtium, or in this case, ficus, we don't observe frequently enough, or festuca in this um, data set, we don't observe frequently enough to be able to do network analysis of. But here's what th I think you can discover from network analysis of Ludwigia. You could, we, what, we, what we know is that the community changes as Ludwigia starts to grow in the, um, in the water. So when it's in the aquatic phase, you get um, bacteria that will start to colonize on its surfaces, leaving a biofilm that then algae can colonize and diatoms can also colonize. And you end up having um, a, a neat, like little microcosm that drives down the pH and ends up killing off a tremendous amount of wildlife around where that Ludwigia event original, originally bloomed. So we could potentially discover what are the diatoms, what are the other microbes that are in that system. Um, and there's probably a lot of other questions we can ask. So I'm going to just pause for a moment here and just ask you to jot down some thoughts of if you know all of the species that are associated with a plant, what could you do with that information? And I'll resume in about 20 seconds. If folks could write that into the chat, that would be great. We can discuss this at the end of the talk. Rachel, would you like to answer a question now or hold I'll, that till I'll the take, end? I could take a question or two. And okay. Then we can continue. Here's one question. Um, Dana Page asks, can the quantitative data give you population estimates for specific species in the area that you're looking at? That is an awesome question. So we're looking at that right now um, in a collaboration with UC Berkeley, where we're trying to get population level information. So we could say how many populations are there or um, how genetically different are the individuals at this place. But we can't actually count individuals from an eDNA sample. So from a single sample, we only actually have the tools to count like up to five individuals. And that would be if we're adding like Microsat data We've um, sort of gleaned this from the forensics community and what they do with DNA information. Um, but you, a lot of people, um, especially at the USGS, are making great advances in using frequency as a proxy for population numbers. So if you detect fish in the species of fish in 80% of your water samples, you can say its population is at least X individuals. And so um, we're very interested in starting collaborations that explore that more. Um, we really haven't done that yet. Oh, how neat. Rachel, would you, like, uh, would you like to hear some of the answers to your question now, or would um, you wait? I, let's, let's go with like a teaser of a couple of them, and then I'll keep going, and then we'll discuss the rest. Sounds good. Um, one, one of the participants is saying disease susceptibility. And mm, so you detect like the pathogens that are for the plant? Associated with the plant, yes. Mm -hmm. Cool. 
And another one is to use the information on commenting on CEQA and NEPA documents so for conservation planning. Those are acronyms that are new to me. So let's definitely uh, discuss uh, those and put them uh, in the chat. All right. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it's nice to have that quantitative information. And so what we're hoping for is as this database grows right now on our website, um, we're at almost a thousand sites with data that you can explore. And so you could look and say, oh, I have um, an interest in uh, detrichia or in lolium. And you can see how many times we've observed that species and if we get to this critical you know, state where you can see, oh, it's been observed over 20 or 30 times, we can actually build you a network. And I think that would be really cool for, that, for your community to, um, to use us as a resource in this way. Um, so our sampling approach uh, is to do bioblitzes, coordinated sampling, we're saying the same day we send everyone out to the coast um, to collect samples and through courses and modules. So we're really excited to build partnerships in this way and to, um, to have other people tell us what they want for bioblitzes where, where data um, would be valuable, where they can actually get used in analysis. And also where the collection, so every collection that you make for CaliDNA goes into a minus 80 degrees Celsius deep freezer, guaranteed to be there for 100 years in the future. And so um, it's like a little time capsule of what lived there at that time or in the area. And it probably includes a mixture of resident species and transient species that were passing through or occurred nearby. And we pay a lot of attention to metadata enabled in, it in order to enable analysis and reanalysis of the information. So, um, and we've also put our informatics pipelines online and a Kappa led by Dr. Emily Kurd is available on GitHub. And, um, and we have a lot of protocols. We're trying to sort of help people get this eDNA metabarcoding optimized. It's still a very young type of science to, 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 to do these broad biodiversity surveys instead of very targeted, you know, single species surveys. So the whole community really needs to grow together. And we just got a brand new lab at UC Santa Cruz and have a lot of undergrads that are looking for projects and have some short term projects. We also have undergrads that just graduated that don't have jobs yet in part, you know, possibly because of the economic situation. It's hard to get trained and hired right now. Um, so we have a full lab of people very interested in helping out with you know, even small questions that people might have about eDNA. And we have new equipment. We actually also have a recharge facility that just opened. So if you have samples and you have funding, you can send them to us and we can process them super quickly. So just a couple more vignettes of our um, research and how this ties into um, invasive plants. We have some vernal pools in Merced that we've been monitoring seasonally for the last couple of years where bioblitzes um, are coordinated seasonally and we go to the same five pools and we sample from the bottom of the pool, the edge of the pool and the upland zone of the pool. Um, and we've processed now two seasons of eDNA from this and just submitted a paper um, led by Dr. Ruiz, uh, Denise Ruiz Ramos, um, who is now at the USGS in Missouri, but she was a postdoc at UC Merced and that was just submitted to molecular ecology, um, where we show that the eDNA from the vernal pools overlaps. So from these, you know, just the two days of sampling that we had processed so far, we get 40 genera that are from known surveys of plants in the area. Um, and we get lots of these invasive grasses. We also were able to detect, so this is like the giraffe in the data set, um, a calusa grass, Neostapia colusana from a single site where we didn't see it, this is when the pools were inundated, but later the, at that site, the grass, the Calusa grass emerged by the thousands. So this is a rare um, species in California and, it's, um, and a lot of the grass DNA we would figure would shroud out that signal because there's so much invasive grass in these areas compared to these endemics, but we still are able to detect the endemics. 
We get a lot of biodiversity of other kingdoms that we can also associate back, right, with those network analyses of what are these invasive plants doing? What is, what's going on with bromus and hordium what it, um, uh, in, in the area? So um, the vernal pools, they fill up when it's a wet year and the dry year, they don't necessarily fill up with water. And um, that climate change might actually exacerbate the, um, uh, the loss of native endemic biodiversity in vernal pools because they wouldn't be as inundated. Uh, inundation is supposed to be good for rare and threatened species, um, who, which, which are a little bit more adapted to that environment. So when we ran these analyses from the two years where we had from the single day in the same season from 2017 and 2018, we had some interesting um, patterns that we saw as results. So 2017 was the wet year, 2018 was the dry year. And then the dry year in plant ITS, this is for plants and algae, the dry year um, is a triangle and the wet year is a circle. The dry year has higher numbers of species. So just saying we encourage more biodiversity doesn't tell the whole story. Um, we actually saw an opposite trend in um, bacteria and, and archaea, where the dry year you saw lower biodiversity, lower numbers of species, um, species richness than the wet year. But for most other things, for invertebrates and for fungi, the dry year actually had higher alpha diversity or higher observed um, taxon richness. So, but does it mean, um, what about the species that are growing there? So we use these network analyses to really try to dig in more to well, what's happening um, actually at the community level and how are these species interacting? And so in the wet year, we see a very tight network of interacting partners. And in the dry year, we see a more distributed network of interacting partners. And it's interesting that the invasive grasses, the Calusa grass is not part of this network. It didn't occur enough times for us to include in this network. Um, but the invasive grasses are more connected to algae here than they are in the wet year where they're largely just connected to each other and very isolated. So what does this mean? Um, and are they exploiting algae to be able to get an edge um, in the dry year, drier year. I'm really interested in your views on this and um, how we can take this further. That was a small study. Um, it didn't, it included like 60 or 70 samples. So let's look a little bit more deeply at the associations between Poaceae and, um, and other species in California. So this is the results from 278 samples. Um, this is uh, graduate student Meishi Lin's work at UCLA. It was just submitted to um, ecological applications. So cross your fingers that reviewers are kind. <laughs> and if you're reviewing the paper, I'm sorry, it's long. <laughs> so we have a network that we did um, with all 278 samples from different parts of California. And we found that Poaceae are associated, which are largely the invasive Poaceae that are in this analysis, um, are largely associated with this fung fungus and Dogonaceae, um, two bacteria and an algae. Chlamydomonas is a really common algae in soils. Um, its ecological role is still really poorly understood. Um, so is this actually a pioneer species that's helping to provide habitat um, for Poaceae? Um, are these two bacteria actually helping Poaceae out as, as like potentially beneficial? Um, uh, is this Indogenaceae, which is um, uh, able to supply nutrients as, an, um, as part of the rhizosphere um, benefiting Poaceae? These are now hypotheses. So this network has given us hypotheses to really dig into more on um, largely microbial taxa that have are, are huge knowledge gaps for us about how they might um, help drive where invasive species occur in the state. And another thing that's really fun about this um, analysis of 278 species that we did was we built maps. So we actually projected biodiversity that we got from 915 families onto California and are able to like look and say, um, well, how do the ecoregions break out with eDNA-based biodiversity? So is what we're seeing um, more representative of, say, the EPA ecoregion map or the USDA ecoregion map, um, which 
which have some very clear differences. Um, for example, this region that I'm circling right here is treated differently in the two different maps. Um, and ours agrees a little bit more with the EPA map. Um, so we have some really cool projects right now that we're trying to get more off the ground. Um, the Santa Monica Mountains, uh, we're looking at community reassembly after wildfire. We have a ton of samples that volunteers have collected and from lagoons at multiple time points over the last couple of years. And so we can actually look at how they were affected by fire, how biodiversity has returned, if it's the same as it was before, or if it's something entirely different. We know that after the fire, invasive species were a huge issue in the Santa Monica Mountains. Um, and so we can sort of watch what's happening with those as they emerge with the bacteria and fungi and archaea and algae and protists that they're associated with. So we have lots of bioblitzes that we're going to be planning um, and lots that we've done in the past and lots of data. And this is actually a new collaboration with Lawrence Berkeley National Labs and with Dave Jacobs Lab at UCLA. Um, a lot of these samples, Rachel Turba de Paula um, coordinated the bioblitzes. So really fun um, opportunities to learn about uh, invasive plants and how they drive the, um, the living environment. Um, one more quick vignette I want to highlight is uh, Dr. Tiara Moore, who's now a postdoc at the University of Washington, uh, was working on lagoons and used um, our, the Cali DNA data to understand how macroalgal blooms happen. So this is with ulva. Um, when it grows out of control in lagoons, it drives eutrophication processes. And she could actually um, combine Cali DNA data with geochip data that showed the actual genes that were being over um, represented in the environment and was able to figure out not only what bacteria are there that colonize the dying ulva, but, um, but what their gene capacity is to be able to have a function in that environment. Um, if they're able to break down cellul cellulose or lignin or chitin or pectin, and, um, and that helped us understand the eutrophication process on a deeper level. So everyone can think to themselves, do I need an invasive species holobiome or a network? Um, this does not have to be just for plants. We've been working with the Center for Natural, Nat Natural Lands Management on crayfish eradication actually in the desert, which is right near my hometown of Palm Desert. Um, so here's the Simone Pond, which is beautiful, except if you were to look, this was uh, before the crayfish removal, if you were to look down into that pond, into that oasis, you would see hundreds, like tens of thousands of pesky little crayfish everywhere. And they reduce the dragonfly population, they, um, they hurt the native plants, they hurt the um, uh, the, the, the habitat in many ways. So they actually drained this oasis, poisoned it with a crayfish neurotoxin, and refilled it, and I'm interested in using eDNA to monitor if crayfish return. So crayfish have historically not had um, really good DNA that they, that's easily tractable with um, with quantitative PCR or with metabarcoding, no two crayfish DNA detection papers are the same. They don't use the same assay because like, as soon as you try what someone else did, it just doesn't work. Um, so what we did is we said, well, screw it. If crayfish don't wanna share their DNA, we'll just use their holobiome. We'll use their network. Um, so we sampled, and this is where we could actually build a network without relying on crayfish DNA, but when we, where we knew crayfish were present. So we sampled sediment and water from the oases. Um, we got to canoe on the oases, which was pretty cool. And um, then we also used water from these tanks where we had the crayfish living for two weeks. We also had control tanks. If you combined the tanks where we knew the crayfish were and the, the biodiversity profiles of the water of those tanks with Simone Pond where they had invaded, and another oasis that did not have crayfish, you can statistically pull out its holobiome, so its network of positively associated taxa. And this includes its, um, the, the uh, microbes that live on its exoskeleton and also the gut microbiome. So the gut microbiome, we can detect much very sensitively to be able to say, oh, well, we see three of the 30 indicator species for crayfish in this part of the oasis. 
maybe check more carefully there. So it'll help people do more precision monitoring for invasive species. Um, so back to Ludwigia, I just ran this network and I'm showing you that it, we actually detect in the, um, the Russian River samples that it is associated with, uh, with ryegrass, with lolium, and um, with hundreds of different uh, bacteria, algae, fungi, and protists. Um, so we're really, um, if, if you have expertise on this species, please get in touch with me. Um, I'm really excited to dig into this further and um, to figure out these grass and Ludwigia associations. This is a picture I just came by um, on our website of Sarah Stinson at UC Davis. She, um, she used this as like her meet the team picture because she does work with Kelly DNA. And it's like, oh, well, that's the network species like right there. That's amazing. Um, and if you have a species that you're interested in, say, Ilanthus altissima, tree of heaven, and you want to make a network of this, um, if you see that it's only observed once in our Cali DNA data set online, um, maybe we should talk about collecting more samples from areas that have Tree of Heaven so that we can eventually have enough data to be able to generate a network for this species. Um, like Festuca, we have enough samples to get a really nice network for Festuca and figure out what are its associated partners. So what can we do with this co-occurrence information? Tell me your ideas. Let's start some joint research. Um, I'm just starting at UC Santa Cruz. I, I just joined it in August, so I'm still building up projects for the lab. And, um, and so uh, this is, again, the group. We also, fortunately, were able to receive some funding from Metabolic Studio, so we are able to keep um, Wayan Kwan and Miroslava Mungia Ramos uh, working with us on CaliDNA. So we actually have a team that's, um, that's here to support these, um, these new collaborations. And I really appreciate being able to be here to talk with you today. And I'm grateful to all the people who have made it possible for us to exist in the first place. So thanks. I will um, yield for questions and discussion. Wow, Rachel, thank you so much. That was fascinating. Um, can I ask you right. to turn on your video? I can't. I just tried. Doug, can I ask you to <laughs> turn on Rachel's video? Yeah, let me give it a shot. Okay. And um, meanwhile, um, we can either start with some of the, the question you post to everybody in the chat, Rachel, or I have, boy, the questions have been pouring in from the audience in the Q&A cool. here. Do we want to start with some of those questions? Yeah, let's go for it. Okay, great. Um, so first question, and I'll ask some of these in order and some of them I'll might ask out of order. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna start with an out of order a little bit. What strategy do you use for deciding where your collection sites are gonna be? It's haphazard collections. So um, often we go with where we are allowed to get samples and where people will, um, are willing to, to provide them to us. So it's really letting the community decide where to go. And I'm, I'm gonna take my prerogative here and just ask you quickly to reflect, how has COVID and stay at home affected some of your sampling strategies and your ability to do bioblitzes and stuff like that? Yeah, um, so, we stopped, we didn't send out kits to people for the last couple of months. And um, Miroslava has gone off uh, to sample so that we can have regular sampling um, on her own time as a volunteer, not representing the university. So we've tried to maintain some baseline of regular sampling at places just by ourselves. Um, she has also started using a GoPro and making <laughs> virtual bio blitzes. And with this metabolic studio project, um, the team is really trying to find ways to more to diversify ways to engage with the public. So we're still developing that. And um, it's a really big question. And certainly when things change, when we're allowed to all hug each other again and stuff, um, the, the need for more diversified um, remote learning experiences and research and connections is not going to go away, right? This is kind of a new normal. So we're trying to embrace that, talking with like the Natural History Museum 
about the extended specimen concept and how museums are kind of re-strategizing on this. I'll end there. Okay. Um, a bunch of people have, are interested in desert areas. Um, one person I hope you saw, I answered your very detailed question by saying, please email me and we'll follow up on that because I see a project <laughs> there. Um, but um, more generally, folks have asked whether you can use these techniques in desert areas and whether the soil algae and bacteria that you talked about a bit from coastal systems also exist in desert soils. Oh my gosh, we have a perfect data set for you for this that I cannot for the life of me get anyone to analyze where we can actually go through like desert um, soil crusts and see what's there and um, see where we find, now that we have so many coastal eDNA sample results, see where we also find those same taxa. So seriously, I will send you the data. <laughs> it's all online already, but like if you want it as an Excel file where it's much more easy to do, you know, basic associations and t-tests and correlations, um, just get in touch. Okay, great. Um, I think this was an interesting one. Can you use eDNA to assess viability of a taxon in an environment where it's not present? Yeah, that's with a model. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I could yeah. see with those networks that you were talking about, if you find sort of the network in one area, but you're like, well, but it's missing the species that's usually a part of it. That right, might be. there's network dropout and you can actually um, calculate how that network would fall apart or would it stay stable. Um, but also models, predictive models that you say, okay, here's how the environment, you know, give me all the environmental factors and here's all the eDNA biodiversity data. Now predict where this biodiversity could be. We're trying to develop those thinking about functional process zones. So like, okay, this is a low pH or high sulfur area. What could live there? And, um, but to build these models, actually, eDNA has never been used in them before. So we have to design a whole new framework. And um, we're currently looking for funding to be able to do that. Neat. All right, I'm going to skip down again because I'm really interested in this one. When collecting a <laughs> big river that runs for several kilometers and maybe even through different countries, is it possible the collected DNA is just, in quotes, passing by? Like the giraffe DNA? Yeah. We saw that signal um, last for a couple of kilometers and then it was gone. So it certainly wasn't everywhere. And what we're thinking of doing is using the network analyses to really figure out, okay, well, what's the actual community at that location? If we collect 30 samples from a location, we can figure out what samples are, what, what tax are interacting with each other at that location. And that might be a mixture of resident species and visiting species. Where, um, or something that's alive and something that recently died because you've got um, saprophytes and all sorts of different taxa that, um, that interact across that living to dead spectrum, mm -hmm. right? So um, yeah, we can, we're hoping that network analyses will help us figure out what's like the functional community unit and then all the other pollen and stuff that blows in or that giraffe poop that happened to pass by just won't really be in, in the network with the other taxa. Right, and I also think it's important for people to, to note that DNA does degrade over time. Um, yeah. And so in this case, over distance. So you're not necessarily, say, getting all the species in an entire watershed when you sample in the estuary. Because things that are really high up in the watershed, it's possible that if they have like a hard seed or something, that that DNA is coming all the way down. But it's also possible that that will just degrade over time. So there's sort of a, depending on the kind of material that's getting in the water, mm -hmm. um, you could sort of figure out, you can see the signal decrease with distance, right? Yeah, yeah. There's, um, there's some really cool experiments that are done in freshwater and in marine systems where you put like, you know, some fish in a cage and let it and see how far away you can, de you can detect that signal. Um, we haven't really done this for terrestrial systems yet. So we, we, we really are, we are actually just talking about what types of experiments can be set up. And also that, um, that signal like the, from the surface. So does DNA in water 
look very different from what it looks like in sediment. It does. And so, you know, what does that rock have on it that's acting like a DNA sponge and holding and binding DNA? Um, we know that clay and sand have very different properties with being able to hold on to and maintain the integrity of DNA. So like, could you 3D print something, put it in water and then pull it out every now and then? And so that you have like an experiment where you have controlled for the surface. Um, yeah, lots of lots of things to do. Very neat. Um, okay, there's a couple questions about the cost, <laughs> either the cost okay. per soil sample or the the cost per kit, that kind of thing. Um, I know mm -hmm. one of these questions is coming from a teacher, and she's interested in participating. Cool. So um, it costs us, or what we charge, um, if. And we were really just starting this up where we're not just doing this for um, with our own grant funds, but if you have something that you really want to process or you, you, you own land and you want your local creek to have its biome sequenced, um, it's $145 a sample. And that's actually lower than you'll find anywhere, anywhere else by far. Um, and we give you really deep sequencing results. So you get about a thousand species or taxa maybe not accurate to species, but you get a thousand species where you have um, uh, some hypotheses of what's there. And can I recommend to the, to the teacher who wrote in, well, I think she was at a college lab because she had said she had undergrads, um, that you might want to contact Rachel and look and see what projects are already funded and are underway where your students might be able to participate and, and actually be helping the researcher out with the costs covered by, say, a research grant. Yeah, um, you're in LA. Uh, the, there's an LA I, River project that we're going to be sampling three times this year at all of these different locations from the tributaries all the way to the Port of Long Beach. So we are looking for classes to get involved. Um, and that, of course, you're not paying for any samples there. but you could go on BioBlitzes and send in stuff that we can put on the website and um, have first access to the data. Okay, it looks like we're about three minutes away from the end of the hour. I still have a whole bunch of questions in here um, I in can the Q&A and, and I haven't even looked at the, at the chat, but I do want to just take a moment to thank everybody for joining us. Um, if, if folks have to leave early, we hope you'll join us tomorrow too for a truly fantastic speaker. No, <laughs> I'm the speaker tomorrow. Um, <laughs> um, and um, when you leave, you are gonna receive a link to a survey um, and we really can use those answers um, to that survey to see how we're doing with these webinar series improve for next year and um, justify you know, the time that uh, Doug and I and Yuda and all the speakers have put into this. So please do answer those surveys. Doug, anything else you wanna say um, before we hit one o'clock? Uh, just thanks very much to Rachel and to all the attendees. There's some great stuff in the chat and uh, we'll definitely pass that along to Rachel so she can sift through all your great ideas and um, feel free to get in contact with her and I'm sure she'll do the same. Rachel, what's Thank the best you. way if people have a follow-up? Is there like a, a Facebook page for discussion with your, your group or something like that um, other than just emailing you? The UC Conservation Genomics Consortium has a Facebook page. Um, Cali DNA is really active on Instagram. So I would recommend going with Instagram to like message and, um, and start some conversations there. We can also then like post stuff that uh, that is relevant that comes out of the discussions. Fantastic. Fantastic. Okay. I'm going to get back to some of the questions. Um, unless Yuda, you have something. I haven't been monitoring the chat or Yuda or Doug had something from Ouch. there that you wanted to ask, but I still have a whole bunch in the uh, Q&A section too. Yeah, I think what we're going to do with the um, suggestions about what to do with eDNA is just uh, forward them all to you, Rachel. There's some great ideas and they yeah. work fairly well with your presentation as well. I could see a follow up um, on um, eDNA and invasive species research either as a session at a future Calypsi meeting or um, in your newsletter. 
maybe something like that. Absolutely. Really Lots of, of interest. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be great. These questions are awesome. And I'll definitely follow up with absolutely everyone who posted stuff here. So oh, wow. Really, great. thanks for putting in the thoughts. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to keep going down the list until Rachel gets tired. Cool. I see one about paleoarchaeology I'd love to answer. Oh, yeah. You know what? You can see the Q&A too. So <laughs> if you'd like to go ahead and jump in there, I'll just keep track of what got answered then. Cool. So we have eDNA that we've um, sequenced from uh, sediment cores from Baldwin Lake up near Big Bear and also Lake Elsinore. Uh, Lake Elsinore goes back 34,000 years and Baldwin Lake goes back 50,000 years, at least from the sample that we took. We get incredible biodiversity profiles. And um, we're trying to align this with the pollen records and charcoal records to try to track how mammal, uh, sorry, how mammal biodiversity and plant biodiversity change through time, especially with the arrival of humans. Um, so those data are going to be coming out uh, later this summer now that the labs are just starting to open up. And I can totally share a couple of preliminary results if you're interested, just follow up with me. Uh, Great. If you want to pick another one, I'm going to answer some about the cost questions by just saying to contact you. Is there a okay, sure. Are you developing your own primer to use for detection? Um, no, no, we're using standard primers um, that are used by the community for metabar coding. Um, we are adding new ones though. So we just started adding vertebrate 12S so we can track vertebrates. And that's how I got the giraffe. But also we track the American beaver, which is um, the Sonoma County asks, uh, for citizen scientists to look for that beaver on the Russian River. And we found it at three sites. I assume you are keeping an eye out for nutria when you're doing this work, if that pops up in any of your eDNA. Yeah, we did not get any nutria. We Good. did get a lot of small mammals. Yeah, we, that's what we want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, and a lot of birds. Joshua Tree Genome Project, they are super cool. And, um, and no, we have not been working with them at all. Uh, actually, some of the desert work in Joshua Tree, because they're archaeological sites, eDNA, when it says you're collecting soil, even though we consider it non-invasive because you're taking like a mill of soil, um, a lot of people treat this like an archaeological, um, distur archaeological site disturbing collection. So we actually, once we had, um, we did a bio blitz in the White Mountains, we had to pay $800 to be able to get a permit to be able to sample there because they considered it um, potentially destroying archeological sites. So we will not be going back there <laughs> for a while. We had one question that may have gotten lost in the chat uh, about okay. endangered species, whether there is any way with eDNA to, um, to link um, a particular rare species with uh, plant species with soil horizons or, or other components you know, of the soil. Yes, yes. And we don't have great capacity to do that right now because you still need lots of observations of a species in order to make those association networks. But as we get more, um, that will become pop, uh, possible. And if you had a particular endangered species that you were interested in, if you collected at least 30 samples that we could detect it in, we could, we could do that. Or if you, you at least map where the endangered species are, just like the crayfish, right? We didn't actually have the crayfish DNA in the samples, but we knew where the crayfish were so we could build those associations. So if you have an endangered species map and we have a lot of overlap of where we've collected samples with your map, then you can put them together. Great. Oh, sorry. I wasn't muted um, when I was typing. I know that can be loud, apologies. Okay, really thank you all so much. This is so awesome. Um, how accurate is Cali DNA? Are two plants in the same genus equated because they haven't been sequenced before? Okay, here's the state of sequencing in California. 90% of families that have been like detected with iNaturalist and are in GBIF have some DNA information publicly available, but 50% of species have that. So we know that species is not very trustworthy. Genus is closer, um, almost as good as family. 
So um, what we do is we actually build this traditional observation score in now. So each time that you have a taxon hit, we say, oh, this is, you know, red flag it because it's an endemic in Japan and it's never been seen in the United States before. Um, or this one, you know, has been observed at the family genus and species level in the US. It's probably a trustworthy observation. Um, so we, we, are, we are building that. Um, and that's why we need projects like the Earth Micro, uh, Earth Biogenome Project and lots of other initiatives to be funded. It only costs like $4 billion to sequence every, the genome of every species on the planet, at least for eukaryotic species. That's less than the human genome cost. <laughs> and like, it's like a couple of, I don't know, fighter jets. <laughs> All right. Here's an, Anything here's else that I should Can I pick one? Can you Go for it. Can you tell from the barcodes when a plant starts flowering or any other phenology information? No, but what if we could with the microbiome? That would be cool. That would be really cool. Yeah. I never thought about that before in my life. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people think, you know, like, oh, new tissue. There's, there's no microbiome on that. Like um, we did an oak leaf project and the oak leaves were only emergent from like four days before, and they had really rich uh, biomes associated with them. You could already see all of the gall wasp DNA inside the leaves, the little baby leaves where they had already like implanted their eggs. It was crazy. Um, can I sample a plant that may be a county record, even if it's on a trail? Uh, <laughs> No. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I mean, that's, that's not so much a, a methods question as a ethics and legality question. Yeah. But if you hike that trail all the time and you saw that plant drop a leaf, <laughs> or if you collected some soil from underneath that plant, it's the wild west of ethics right now. Like, you know, you own your shoes. And so when you track, when you hike that trail and you go home, you can take the, the soil from your shoes and send it into us. And that would be allowed. You'd give permission for that. Right. <laughs> but really, you know, you're getting information about someone else's property. It's the same as when we sequence ourselves, right? If, if I was, um, if my dad, I didn't know who it was and he wanted to be anonymous, and say he had donated anonymously to a sperm bank, I could figure out who my dad is now. And so that's the same ethical situation that we're in with eDNA. Um, so we're really trying to make sure that we have at least records where we show that we've gotten permission um, to the best extent that we can. A lot of permitters, if you are a land manager and you do not have clauses in your permits about eDNA, um, or non-invasive collections, um, and and you know it's probably a good time to start thinking about that. <laughs> you just made your life. We might come and knock it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, do you correlate the percent coverage by species? We get presence absence, and we get relative abundance. And I'm wondering, um, Mary, if you're still online, what percent coverage means here? I can move this meantime, out of the way. Jump over. Um, can this be used to show that a species that is not considered invasive yet, I'm work, working to be early to declare non-invasive, non-native milkweeds uninvasive, that it should be. Ooh, we can provide the base data. So if you want to see if milkweeds degrade soil in the same way that other invasives do, you could potentially do a project on that. Um, and so we could provide the data for that, but we can't make the call. We can't say we decide that milkweeds are just as bad as these other species, um, non-native milkweeds. Uh, we, we can just say, here's the patterns. So we're trying to stay out of that type of um, grading or decision-making side and leave that to the experts that do make decisions. Are you trying to build a world database or just local? Cali DNA now has samples from Palmyra Atoll and Minnesota. So we're growing very slowly out of California. Um, and, and we're and actually talking. Oh, sorry. Pardon? 
Oh, I was just going to say there was another question asking if there were similar eDNA surveys in the eastern U.S. So it might be good to answer. I know one for the Great Lakes that's starting, and the Smithsonian is really interested in starting an eDNA collection. Um, so it might it might take off more. And the Department of Energy, uh, the Pacific Northwest National Labs, they actually have kits that you can get, not just for eDNA, but for RNA um, and lots of other uh, high, like sort of physiochemical qualities. It's called the Wonders Kit, W-H-O-N-D-R-S. Uh, we're gonna hold an eDNA meeting maybe sometime next year. So stay tuned for that. Um, that's with Squirp, and it'll be pretty cool. Um, we're also going to make sure that we have much more diversity in that meeting than you've seen in eDNA meetings in the past, where it's been often too white. Hmm. Um, okay, I think we're covering a lot, and we're at 110, and you think we're good, or should we keep going? Definitely. Some of these are longer answers where I should write an email. Yeah, let's see if there's something. Um... Okay. One shot sampling or samples over time. Yeah, we need more temporal sampling to be able to understand the stability of that signal, the seasonality of that signal. So Kate, thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, and that's like part of why we are really trying to sustain some base level of repeated sampling. Those are some of our most precious samples. Um, they tell us so much about how eDNA degrades. Um, so yeah, yeah, we're interested. And um, we're at least trying to hit every UC reserve, or most UC reserves, um, multiple times. Yeah. Uh, for certain types of organisms stick around and degrade faster than other types, very unknown, uncharted territory. Um, it might, okay, have you used this for agricultural crops? We are um, just starting to, and we would love to have more agricultural um, projects. So uh, Kim, Dr. Kim Belair, who's a postdoc at UC Santa Cruz, has been working um, with a, a farm that's, that was a Brussels sprouts farm that's now converting into a biodynamic farm. That'll be interesting to see. Um, but yeah, we'd love to do more on agriculture. And, and building off of that, are you working already with NRCS or the RCD? Um, do you know those groups that do um, soil sampling to, to do like soil maps and stuff? They're not really interested. They're interested in the geology side of it. Yeah, we've used their data, but we've never actually had any collaborations. Oh, I'll make some introductions if you like. Sounds good. <laughs> Um, can you share more about how NASA is able to help with remote sensing of abiotic data? Oh, cool. Yeah, so um, California is where they did a lot of test flights for um, hyperspectral data that are going to be, um, I, they're going to inspire the sensors that are going to be put on a new satellite that's going to go up in 2022. That's all about measuring biodiversity. Um, so the, so California actually has like the best remote sensing data available, especially for Avaris and LIDAR. Uh, and so a lot of those data sets have been processed. So like, you know, you're dealing with like many terabytes, petabytes of data uh, from the last seven years where uh, NASA's run these flights. And so um, some of those locations like uh, the, uh, the National Forest around LA, um, also, like in Yosemite, where there's that CZO, the Kings Canyon, Kings River area, um, a lot of different pockets of California now have really awesome processed data sets that you can, that you can use. Um, and NASA Ames is a good um, website to go to and email them. They're, they have people whose job it is, is to get you analysis ready data sets so that you don't have to do it on your own. And Google Earth Engine, we have a Jupyter Notebook if you're interested in downloading stuff like Sentinel-2, which is from the European Space Agency, gives you really great biodiversity informative information. You can actually make a beta diversity map with Sentinel-2 data alone. That's not bad. <laughs> and, um, and I can send you software for how to do that and the Jupyter Notebook for so that you could get that data for yourself um, from the time window that you're interested in. And for folks for whom that was gobbledygook, um, the Jupyter <laughs> Notebook is a, it's a, 
it's a site uh, for sharing software code on the web. It's not about mm -hmm. Jupiter, the planet. Just, <laughs> since we were talking about NASA. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. There, well, there's two questions left. So okay. you might as well stick around and answer them. Okay. Anonymous attendee. What makes sense to cre create a co kinetic network to understand habitat selection of a fish that's endangered with a severely declined population? There's been efforts to learn about Delta smelt. Yeah. So Sarah Stinson is um, doing some eDNA work at Yolo Basin, working on Delta smelt. Um, yeah, associated species would be cool. I think there's data and we can take our methods and apply it. So if you know of eDNA data from where there's Delta smelt, we can try that out. Um, of course, we need a mixture where they're there and where they're not there. Right, right. Do you work at all no. um, with the NOAA Santa Cruz lab who does a lot of work on endangered salmonids, Carlos Garza? Uh, car uh, yeah, Carlos and I know each other and uh, we're, we're very friendly. I've worked more with Devin Pierce uh, who yeah. works for Carlos um, and, and also on salmonids. We actually uh, co-taught a graduate seminar in winter quarter. Oh, cool. So that, so that might be a place to kind of look for those opportunities focused on steelhead and coho and some of the endangered salmonids too. Yeah, yeah. We detected Chinook salmon in our Russian river samples and with the LA River project, we'll also be getting a lot more data that are, um, it could be useful for fish networks, but it all depends on having sufficient positive hits of the fish. Yes, and that'll be really interesting when it comes to Kind of making that determination it would be neat if you guys were co-collecting data to look at the mm -hmm. larger genome to probe for steelhead markers as opposed to just omicus presence yeah because then you can try to figure out whether they're um historic mm -hmm. resident steelhead or right. could be you know introduced right on which by the way i'll be talking a little more about tomorrow Super cool. Yeah, um, we'd like to do, we're actually going to start doing shotgun sequence data along with um, meta barcoding so that okay. we can take, like, we can actually get, um, we can do de novo genome assembly for some of the microbes and figure mm -hmm. out functional process from there. Uh, and you could potentially map those shotgun data to a Salmona genome and see if you can get population level SNP data. Mm -hmm. That'd be cool. Again, we have like no funding for projects yeah. that are not earmarked for like a couple of places in California right now. So it's really hard to say like, yeah, let's try this out. Um, but that would be so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But at least with these rivers, we will have funding and data to, to generate that. Yeah. Um, okay. To, I'm going to go. Generate. People are still typing in questions, but I know oh you God. have other things to do too. So, so Kate S. had a question that she typed in during the Okay. <laughs> During our hour, so. Determine what occurs at a given site. That's the time question. I think I addressed yeah. that. Yeah. And then Craig. Hi, Craig. Nice to see you here. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, we can send kits out now. I think that the state has started to reopen. Um, we didn't feel like it was the right thing to do for a while. So we kind of shut down. Phew. Well, we, I'm, I'm not even going to look at the chat. You've answered 36 <laughs> questions. <laughs> thank you. That, that is really just fun. fantastic. And thank you so much, Rachel. This was just fascinating. And I hope for some of you who have been listening to, you know, information about invasive species for a long time, that this was, was something, something new. Um, Doug or Yuda, did you have anything to add? That was tremendous. You're exactly <laughs> yeah. right. Brand new and um, opens up worlds of possibilities. So um, thanks so much for sharing and uh, thanks for running the meeting, Sabrina. Oh, no problem. <laughs> Sorry for the hiccups at the beginning. Okay, well, thank you, Great everyone. Time. Yuda, did you want to say anything? Sorry. I just that I really enjoyed the talk and I think it's uh, wonderful to see kind of a next uh, a next uh, 100 years, you know, moving forward, this is a, a new dimension for ecology and for invasive species. So it's great for research. I think it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun, but it's certainly something that like no one has good expertise in. 
So like we're all beginners and yeah. we really need the public and diverse minds to guide what research to do. So um, we really want to build those partnerships, that feedback loop in as soon as possible. Um, so please, please stick around. Sabrina, you've been tremendous opening up opportunities for us to connect with people um, that do really cool work. I'm so grateful to you for this, Doug. It's a pleasure to meet you and Yuta as well. Um, so please, like, if you have ideas of how we can contribute to the Cal uh, Invasive Plant Council, that would be amazing. Great. Okay, thank All you. Right. Thank you. And thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks, and everyone, we'll, for sticking around. We'll see you tomorrow.